Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. A couple of housekeeping notes before we get started. Uh, if you look to the right side of your screen, you will see the Q&A Submit Questions here box. Here you will be able to type in questions to send to our speakers. You can type into that text box at the bottom and press the Send button or Enter to submit your questions. Uh, keep in mind, all audience questions are anonymous and will be responded to in the order in which they were received. Uh, with that, I'll turn it over to Jody Weinzettel, Senior Global Director of Education for Medtronic for the opening introductions. Jody, over to you. Wonderful, Tyler. Thank you so much, and welcome, everybody. Good evening. Thank you so much for joining us. A big thank you to ATS, who we are partnering with tonight to sponsor this webinar for you. I'm really looking forward to a lively one-hour discussion here with some wonderful experts who are going to walk us through Accuracy is Everything, Recent Clinical Evidence in Navigation. Uh, these gentlemen will be spending some time talking about CT to body divergence, really understanding the causes and effects of what that does in procedures, talking about clinical evidence from recent studies, as well as discussing solutions to help solve for CT to body divergence. And tonight we have moderating with you Dr. Krish Badra. He's an interventional pulmonologist, comes from Chattanooga, Tennessee at CHI Memorial Hospital, where he's the medical director and leads the Interventional Pulmonology Lung Care Associates Group. And with that, I will turn it over to you, Dr. Badra, to help lead the session tonight. Thank you so much. Thank you, uh, thank you, Jody. I appreciate it. Um, today we have uh, speaking um, Dr. Michael Pritchett and Dr. Mark Bowling. Uh, Dr. Pritchett is in Pinehurst, North Carolina, and president of the SAB. And Dr. Bowling is uh, chief of pulmonary critical care at East Carolina University. Um, thank you guys for joining us. And I can see Mike is on the WebEx, uh, not the WebEx, but the webcam, and I can see you there. I'll hand it over to you, and then we'll talk a lot about CT to body divergence, accuracy, and how to improve techniques for navigation bronchoscopy. Thanks so much, Krish. I'm going to pull up my screen here. Um, thanks to Medtronic for asking me to uh, speak tonight. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about um, you know, the concept of CT to body divergence. I think these are terms that you're hearing more and more of uh, these days. And then the good part of this talk is that Dr. Bowling is going to come on after me and tell you how to fix this. Uh, or how to adjust for it. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about why it occurs and how to prevent it uh, or minimize it, and then he'll talk about how to overcome it uh, with a diagnostic platform. So the concept of CT to body divergence is, is not a new one. Everybody who's done navigation bronchoscopy has uh, experienced this, whether they know it or not. Uh, this is just something showing you that in yellow is your, you know, your 3D map based on your pre-procedural CT scan. However, during the procedure, when you're doing your registration with superdimension, the, those purple dots are registering the airway a little bit off. And so those two things not matching up is going to lead to you not having success during your procedure. So we'll talk about the virtual target, and that's not always where the real target is. And that difference between those two things is the concept of CT to body divergence. One of the things that contributes to this is the whole ventilation strategy. When you do your preoperative CT scan, that's done at an inspiratory hold that the patient generates themselves on the table of the CT scanner. However, where you're doing your EMB procedure is more towards the tidal volume uh, range. And so the differences between those can just by itself, without any other factors, uh, you know, without a scope or an instrument or biopsy tool or anything like that affecting the airways, which happens also. Um, but just this phenomenon by itself can contribute to that problem. So I'm hoping that you've all heard of this concept of atelectasis, and, not a concept, but the concept of atelectasis affecting electromagnetic navigation bronchoscopy. Uh, it's something that Dr. Bodger and I, uh, you know, get on our soapbox about all the time uh, because we've had the benefit of doing intraoperative cone beam CT scan with our cases, and that's what these images are from. So we've kind of seen the light, if you will, and what we want to do is tell everybody about that. And uh, we've come up with methods kind of independently, but also working together uh, to really minimize or, or eliminate atelectasis. What you may not realize is that 85 to 90 percent of all patients undergoing general anesthesia have some degree of atelectasis. You know, when you're in there for a gallbladder or whatever, uh, it's usually inconsequential. Um, 
when you're in there doing bronchoscopy, again, if you're doing a guided bronchoscopy where you're relying on the preoperative CT scan, it's going to be very consequential. And even if you get atelectasis in the lower lobe, if you have a lesion in the upper lobe, it changes your 3D tree. Dr. Casal from MD Anderson published a study that showed that in 40% of his cases, he saw atelectasis, and in 20% of those cases, the lesion completely got obscured. Uh, so that can give you false radial probe images. You put your radial probe down, you think you see the image, but what you're really seeing is atelectasis. And you won't typically see this unless it's really bad on regular fluoroscopy. So it's one of those things that if you can't see it, people just think that it doesn't exist. Uh, but those of us who've been doing comium for a while can tell you that we can see it on a lot of cases if certain things aren't uh, taken into consideration. The key thing that Dr. Casal also pointed out there is that you typically cannot reverse atelectasis once you get it during your case. Once you see dense atelectasis like this picture here, even increasing the PEEP and doing recruitment breath, uh, you may be stuck with that. So we've um, proven before that there's divergence even between the pre-procedural CT scan and your initial comb beam. So right after the patient is intubated is when this middle scan was done. This wasn't 45 minutes into a long case. This was immediately after intubation, we see atelectasis. And when you're going after a very small lesion like this, this was actually supposed to be a dye marking case. Um, and if I were to lose that, and my mark isn't in the right place, then the surgeon's not going to be able to see it, and the case is essentially ruined. Here's something from one of our recent publications. Uh, this is an example uh, where you can actually see the nodule on the tomosynthesis scan, and this is with fluoronav. Um, but as the case goes on, you see expanding atelectasis, the catheter's moving out of position, and then over in panel C, you see everything is just gone. Um, and again, this is typically not something you see on regular x-ray or fluoroscopy. This is uh, on tomosynthesis scans, which are kind of mini cone beam scans, if you will. Um, and you can see how significantly that affects your accuracy on these studies. So what types of bronchoscopy does this apply to? It really applies to everything. Electromagnetic navigation, robotic bronchoscopy, whether you're doing shape sensing with ion or EMB guided uh, with Oris Monarch, uh, it really doesn't matter. You'll get atelectasis. If you're using thin scope and rebus, you'll get atelectasis. If you're doing cone beam, you'll get atelectasis if you're not being careful uh, with some of these things. Now, some of these, like the thin scope and cone beam, is not necessarily dependent at all upon the pre procedural CT scan, so it's a little less important. But all the others, EMB and robotics, um, you're completely dependent uh, on your pre-procedural CT scan uh, to tell you where that lesion is supposed to be. So we came up with this anesthesia protocol called, called the Pinehurst Protocol. Um, and Dr. Badra also uh, has come up with a protocol that uh, he's uh, in the process of publishing right now. Uh, and this protocol has actually been published, and I'll, I'll show you that uh, afterwards. But in general, uh, we do a variety of things to prevent that electrosis, and this has been shown to be incredibly helpful. We want to do incentive spirometry before the cases. We do a rapid intubation, not rapid sequence, but we just don't want uh, any messing around. We don't want four medical students looking at the vocal cords before you intubate. We want to get it done quickly. Um, we typically use a nine ET tube in men and an eight and a half in women. We prefer an endotracheal tube over an LMA because when we use those higher pressures, uh, we want a good seal and you don't always get that with an LMA. Very importantly, immediately after intubation, we want to get the FiO2 down to the lowest tolerable level. High levels of oxygen or hyperoxia by themselves cause absorptive atelectasis, and that will throw off your case. Um, you probably don't even know. Most of your cases are probably done with 100% FiO2 through the whole case. Um, if you have a prolonged intubation, we know that that happens. You can consider recruitment maneuvers. Um, definitely need to use paralytics when you're talking about using fluorocyte, uh, or sorry, fluorocyte. I just combine those two together. Medtronic <laughs> should think about using that name. Uh, fluoronav and alumicite um, or cone beam, you know, you really want to think about using paralytics that helps to keep the diaphragm down, uh, and you need to do breath hold maneuvers during these as well. We use a higher level of PEEP. We use a minimum of 10 of PEEP. Um, if it's a lower lobe lesion or posterior or obese, we'll easily go up to, to 15 of PEEP. We do higher tidal volumes. Remember, this isn't an ARDS patient in the ICU. We're not measuring plateau pressures and concerned about higher 
tidal volumes. So we typically go about 10 cc's per kilogram of ideal body weight. We will use a little bit less than that if they've had uh, a lobectomy and certainly if they've had a pneumonectomy. Uh, there's a valve on your uh, machine. When you do the breath holds, you switch over into manual mode, and this allows a certain or a certain pressure of oxygen uh, to constantly fill that. So it's basically a peep. Uh, valve, uh, if you will, when you go into manual hold. You need to use paralytics, and we typically set this between 20 and 40, depending on the lesion location. The other key thing that we strongly recommend is that you do navigation first before your EBA staging. Obviously, if you have, you know, really obvious disease on CT scan or PET scan, do EBAs first because you may not need to do uh, ENB. Um, but if, if you have a normal level of suspicion um, we want you to do navigation first because EBUS is a bigger scope. There's difficulty with flows. It causes anatomical changes, can cause bleeding and atelectasis, and that promotes CT to body divergence. So again, we've published this, Dr. Badra um, uh, and myself, along with Eric Folk from Mass General and a team from Medtronic, uh, put together this uh, article basically talking about CT to body divergence, and we did publish that protocol uh, here uh, so you can always look that up if you'd like. It's basically the same thing that I just showed you. So That's does this case. really yeah. matter? The, the simple answer is yes, it does. This is a case that I did uh, last year. Um, and if I had any atelectasis on this lesion, the case would have been over. I wouldn't have been able to get to it. Uh, but you can see this is a cone beam image of the edge catheter and the locatable guide right in the middle of this very small lesion. Uh, but again, any atelectasis would not have allowed us to do that. Uh, just two months ago, Dr. Casal uh, published another paper where they looked at the incidence of atelectasis um, based on lung segment. They assessed this by rebus, not quite as sensitive as a way, in my opinion, compared to cone beam. But what they found was that in their study, they didn't use PEEP or they used very minimal. They had patients ventilated with 100% oxygen. They found that elevated BMI and also the time were the biggest risk factors. But look at the percentages of atelectasis in each lobe. Um, and this just shows you that there's a big problem going on. Um, so to talk a little bit about fluoroscopic navigation, which is what Dr. Bowling's going to get into here in a second. Uh, Dr. Bodra and I also uh, published a study looking at the fluoroscopic navigation correction. And what this showed, you guys are all familiar with this, and I'll leave these images to, to Dr. Bowling. He's got some great videos to show you about uh, these cases. But basically, you drive to the green ball, you do your fluoroscopic navigation, and then you make an adjustment. And we had to make a big adjustment in this case. And even though this is a very small semi-solid lesion, we were able to easily see it on the fluoro-nav images. We saw that the, our catheter was actually past it. We pulled back, adjusted. So what we wanted to do in this study is look at 50 patients, 25 at Dr. Bodra's institution, 25 at mine. We wanted to look at the percentage of overlap between the virtual target and the actual target. Okay, so the virtual target is the is the image in red, the red sphere, and then the actual target is the blue sphere. The overlap between those two is the purple, and we wanted to see if we could increase the degree of overlap um, or basically improve accuracy. We weren't looking for diagnostic yield. This was purely just an accuracy study. The primary endpoint example, again, was getting greater than 0% overlap after correction. So what you see in the left hand there is uh, a little bit on the edge, and this is only in one plane. It's very important to look in all three planes. You may look like you're on it in one plane, um, but you really could be off in the other two. So this is showing you um, how we can improve that percentage overlap um, and in the last case, we had 0% overlap. We drove to the virtual target. It wasn't there. We corrected, and we were 94% overlap with the actual target as based on cone beam CT. This is really the impactful figure here, and I'm, this is my last slide I'm going to leave you with. Um, but before the correction, um, we saw a significant um, proportion that had very low overlap. And so 31% there, um, you can see, um, had no overlap. And we diminished that to less than 5%. So we're dramatically reducing the numbers and we're shifting all this down. Um, and we had 95.1% of patients that had an overlap um, of the virtual and the actual target after that fluoronav correction. 
okay? So before correction, only 68. After that, 95%. We can't promise that your, you know, your diagnostic yields will be those uh, because there's a lot of things that are out of the hands of the technology. A lot of technologies can get you to the lesion. What you do when you're there um, is up to you. Uh, but again, this showed that you can overcome some of that CT to body divergence, correct for it, and in improve your overlap with the actual lesion, which we think will therefore increase your diagnostic yield. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Bowling or Dr. Bodra, if he's gonna moderate some questions or anything. Yeah, Dr. Pritchett, um, quick question about, um, can you talk a little bit about this APL valve and what happens? Because a lot of uh, people, when they're using Alumicide or Fluoronav, um, they're going to have to do uh, static breath holds during the tomosynthesis sweep. Um, and maybe explain in a little bit of detail what you're doing with that APL valve, because a lot of pulmonologists, we go through training, and it wasn't until I started doing a large high volume of uh, bronchoscopy, especially with advanced imaging techniques, that I recognized that this atelectasis was an issue, and in particular, uh, what this APL valve does and how it can how it can change the dynamics during that breath hold. Yeah, so that's a good question. And, and, you know, that's not something that is on a standard ventilator that we deal with in the ICU. So as much as pulmonary and critical care doctors know about, um, you know, anesthesia and ventilators, uh, we don't really know about that. So basically there's, there's a switch. So when you can switch the anesthesia machine from automatic into manual, and you flip that over, and then that's where everybody's familiar with that bag that's hanging down, you know, the AMBU bag that's hanging down on the machine. So if you just flip that switch, the bag would be completely deflated. Just think of the bag as what the patient's alveoli look like. It's completely deflated. However, if you turn this valve, you can adjust amount of pressure that will divert into that bag and therefore into the patient, and you can set exactly what pressure you want that to be. So if you set it at 20, we try to set it before we flip that over into manual, and then the bag will already be full, and therefore the alveoli will already be full. That also pushes that pressure in so it keeps the diaphragm down. The one thing that most people also don't realize is that paralytics don't actually paralyze your diaphragm uh, completely. When you're laying on the table and you've got obesity, that obesity will overcome your your diaphragmatic paralysis and it'll push up higher and higher and higher. So that APL valve controls pushing the diaphragm down and you do need to wait a few seconds. That's a key thing as well. When you flip that over and the APL valve is full, kind of like your difference between your inspiratory pressure and your plateau pressure when you're measuring those in the ICU. So when you flip that over, give that a good five to 10 seconds for the pressures to equilibrate and the motion to stop so that when you do either your cone beam scan or your fluoroscopic navigation tomosynthesis scan, you want as little movement as possible. And that's also where the paralytics come in. You don't want your patient just slightly breathing because all your pictures will be blurry. Um, so hopefully that answered your question a little bit about that. Yeah, that does. One of the, one of the images that you had shown is uh, this extraordinarily small lung nodule close to the diaphragm. And when I start thinking about those types of lesions, it's pretty intimidating when you're, you know, utilizing navigation bronchoscopy. One of the questions, you know, looking at your uh, navigation pro or your ventilation protocol and you're going after these, uh, these lung lesions that are that small with such a high level of success, you know, I, I think what's, what's really interesting is that you're ad we're advocating for a high tidal volume uh, with, you know, 10 cc's per kilogram and high PEEP strategy, which is kind of counter to um, the teaching of modern-day anesthesiologists and pulmonologists. And so are there any hang-ups with these types of uh, ventilation protocols? I mean, do you see any complications? I immediately think, oh, do you, you know, are you going to run into more pneumothoraces? Um, are you going to have barotrauma, pneumomediastinum? What happens? What do you see in your practice utilizing these types of ventilation strategies? Yeah, it's a good question. And so uh, I think, you know, if somebody called me to the ICU to do a transbronchial lung biopsy on a patient on a ventilator on like 12 a peep, I'd say, no thanks. Like, I'm going to drop this guy's lung. But when we do it during navigation bronchoscopy, it's just a different scenario. Um, uh, 
these patients do not have an increased risk of pneumothorax. Uh, we have uh, shown that in some of our studies. I know, you know, you've done hundreds of these cases as well with higher people. So we do not see an increased risk of pneumothorax. Your pneumothorax risk should be the same. Um, you can still get it, um, but we don't see a higher incidence with it. We don't see any barotrauma or pneumometastinum or anything like that. You're right, it was a little bit different. Um, and anesthesia was like, okay, are you sure? But we you know, I've helped institute this anesthesia protocol at so many different institutions. We've never gotten pushback from anesthesia. They actually really love being part of the team. When you go to anesthesia and you say, hey, um, we think that this technique will help us do even better. Can you help us out? They feel like they're part of the team and they're very helpful and they really want to be involved. We haven't gotten any pushback uh, on this. They definitely have to have some explanations and I think that's fair if you're asking them to do something different. They just want to know why and how it makes a difference. So it's very important to have these proactive conversations with your anesthesiologist ahead of time. And they have a copy of my protocol. So even if I have a new CRNA in the room, they know the protocol, they know what to do. If you have a case like that one that I showed, the little tiny thing, I will seek out anesthesia before my case starts. I will go to them and say, hey, it's all on you for this case. I really need you on this one. Uh, let's make sure we do a good job on this one because if I lose this, the case is over. So just having those proactive conversations with anesthesia and involving them uh, is going to be very helpful to you. Yeah, and another concept I think a lot of people run into uh, a little bit of difficulty is understanding that once you, once atelectasis does develop, and we've been through this before, uh, once you lose the lesion and it becomes obscured, uh, and I think in Casal's small study it was around 20% um, of his cases that he was doing with conventional ventilation, um, that's a large number. I mean, that could l literally render your entire bronchoscopy futile if you, if the lesion is lost in atelectasis. Um, when when you're dealing with uh, losing uh, the lesion and obscured, uh, kind of go walking through that thought process as to why it's difficult to reinflate the lung, um, and that's something I think that you know just to kind of hammer home uh, to the audience is. You know, when the lung uh, becomes atelectatic, there's forces in the lung like surfactant that will help uh, with hydro uh, hydrophilic forces, trying to forcing the lung to uh, be deflated. Um, you'll see that as you decrease the radial uh, radius of or the diameter of the bronchial tubes, that there'll be increased uh, resistance. You'll see that there's increased turbulent airflow, and then all culminates into the lung being essentially at the wrong end of the compliance curve. And so if you if you think about it a different way, it's if you have a you know, you're at your kid's birthday party, you ask them to blow up a balloon that's deflated, it's always hardest in the beginning. And I think that's something that's really interesting is that once you, you want to prevent atelectasis and it's so incredibly important. Um, and thanks for your answers on that. And one last thing I wanted to ask is about uh, this concept of digital tomosynthesis. Now there's some people in the audience uh, that have or you know don't understand what that is, don't understand what that technique involves. What is a digital tomosynthesis, and uh, how how is that performed? And I know Dr. Bowling is going to go into this, and we're going to see some amazing videos. But just in just to kind of uh, make it easy for people to understand, what are, what are you talking about? Yes, yeah, so that's a good question. And so all tomosynthesis is, is is spinning your C-arm while you're actively shooting x-ray. And you typically do it from, you know, certain angles. So 25 degrees and 25 degrees. Um, so you start your C-arm over here at 20 degrees, you press the chloro pedal, and you hold it down while you're sweeping all the way over uh, to the other side. Uh, and you can get varying degrees of this. And so what we do, and so that information is tied in with uh, the ENB system now, specifically with uh, Illumicite and Fluorinev. And so what that does is it, it allows you to stack all those images. So instead of one plane and one image, you're basically taking a series of images all the way across, and then you stack them on top of each other. And then what that software, it's all about the software algorithm. The software algorithm that Medtronic has and that they've come up with um, to uh, enhance these so that you could take that picture that I showed you of that kind of one and a half centimeter semi-solid lesion and then you stack it 40 times from different angles all on top of each other and then you can suddenly see that little spot that was not previously fluoroscopically visible. Once you can show that spot, then you just tell the computer that's where the actual lesion is. 
and then it says, okay, I've updated your green ball to be on that location. And that's how the Toma synthesis works. And again, getting nice sharp pictures is important. So doing a breath hold with paralytics during your sweep, you know, typically takes 15 to 20 seconds uh, with FluoroNav when you're doing that. And, um, and so that's what digital Toma synthesis is. Um, you know, we, we've, I've kind of jokingly referred to it as poor man's cone beam. Um, but the important thing is, is that you can do that with your regular C-arm and get these amazing images. Not everybody can afford cone beam, but everybody's got a C-arm. And so when you do your digital sweep of that and they have their software algorithm that allows you to see what you couldn't see before, that's the game changer here. And that's something that other platforms, even robotics, don't have. Yeah, that's an important uh, concept to highlight is that this is, you can go after lung lesions that were previously invisible on fluoro and now they become visible. And that is powerful. I know that as a bronchoscopist, you know, everybody who's on this phone call um, will agree we're much better at navigating to lung lesions we can see than we can't see. And I think that's one of the big benefits. So with, on that note, I'm going to uh, introduce Dr. Bowling uh, again, Dr. Bowling from East Carolina University. He's uh, now working in the ICU and he's, um, and he's with us today and we'll switch over to the slides. And uh, he is one of the, I think he's the first in the world to do cases on the Illumisite platform. And so I'm really curious to see what his thoughts are and what his experience has been. And I know that he's uh, shown some videos uh, that are really compelling. And so I'll hand it off to you. Basically, this is the new navigational platform. It's the Luma site, and it has the two aspects that, uh, at least one of the two aspects that Dr. Pritchett was just talking about, which is the uh, fluoroscopic navigational technology, which will correct for the CT to body divergence. And the other um, impelling tool that is uh, part of this new platform is a continuous image. You get a continuous navigational image, which is very important. Um, so this is just the navigational technology. Uh, Dr. Pritchett really went over most of this. You saw some of the images that he had, um, but the uh, continuous navigational um, technology allows you, again, to be able to take lesions and be able to see them much better. Um, mo based on that digital tomosynthesis uh, uh, technology that, that Dr. Pritchett had mentioned. Um, second is the continuous uh, guidance image, and I'm going to show you some live pictures here, but essentially what happens is once you take the LG out, you still have a continuous navigational image here, and you get this very nice screen, which you actually can break down and show different types of, of images. You can have a radial image, your live um, fluoroscopic image, and then you also have this uh, kind of local alignment image that allows you to be able to have continuous alignment with the target as you biopsy, which is con which is definitely new from what we've had previously. So this is just the procedural overview. I'll kind of talk you through it. So basically you start just like you would normally. Um, you go in and you do a registration. You're not doing any breath hold or anything of that nature. And you go through and you do your registration. And then once you're done doing that, you normally navigate to the, to the green ball. Um, so once you get within two centimeters of the target lesion, you go ahead and you launch the local registration and you position the C-arm, this is what you're seeing here. And you kind of say, this is the head, this is the left. And then um, you take that little circle and you got to put the LG right in the center of that circle. Um, but at the same time, still kind of using your um, using your fluoroscopy, you want to keep it to where these beads are even and it's a 90 degree. It's a very self-explanatory process. It's not hard at all. If you can read, you can do it. Um, so once you once you get things set up and you get the the LG catheter here lined up into that where that circle is, then you're going to get ready for your breath hold. And what you do at this point is you go and you take one little snapshot at an LAO position at 25, and then a snapshot at an LAO position at negative 25. Then you come back to the AP position and you take a shot. And then once you're ready. What you're going to do is you're going to start a very slow roll. You're going to take a breath hold, um, very much of what doc, Dr. Pritchett had mentioned previously. And there's lots of different ways you can do this. You can use lots of different scenarios. Uh, basically, what we did is we just held it tidal volume. Uh, but you start at the 25 position once you've got the breath hold, and you slowly move to the negative 25 position over about 12 to 15 seconds, as you see. And I, and I think that's what we capture right here. 
So you do the breath hold. We did ours at tidal volume, and then you do a very slow roll that's going to come across, um, which is what you're seeing here. The technicians can learn this very easily. Um, it just takes a little bit of practice, nothing big. Now this is going to go and it's going to do all of its computer magic now. So first image that you get is you've got to be able to look and you want to, what you're essentially doing is you're doing local registration. You're re-registering around that lesion. And in order to do that, you've got to tell the computer two things. You've got to say, computer, this is where the tip of the catheter is. And then you got to say, computer, this is where the re-registered, re-imaged target lesion is right now. So this is actually marking the tip of the catheter. Once you do that, then you go and you got to say, okay, computer, now this is the new target lesion. Now look at these images. I'm not uh, uh, as talented as the guys on the phone are with you. I, going after these little five millimeter, those those lesions are, are really remarkable. And uh, my hats off are, are to Dr. Pritchett, Dr. Bodra, and all the other very talented bronchoscopists out there can do that. I'm, I'm a two centimeter guy. I'm a one to two centimeter guy, and that's pretty much all I go after. Every once in a while, I'll get lucky and get a get an eight millimeter or something like that. Um, and our surgeons do our own um, do their own dye marking, so so it's I don't actually deal with that, but. Uh, you can see these lesions really look very nice. I have seen a five millimeter lesion um, using this technology, but look at the image that you get. It's really remarkable. Um, and now what you're going to do is you're going to tell the computer, okay, computer, this is the target lesion. So you do that. Then you're going to tell the computer, this is the target lesion in two extreme positions, the LAO position or RAO position. Now you're doing this while you're doing the procedure and what and we actually have a wireless mouse right up to the, next to the head of the patient and and you're just sitting there moving and doing this um, uh, at, right at the bedside and it's very easy to do and, and you don't have to have a million people to hold this and hold that. Um, I'm able to do this holding the scope and doing this stuff and if I can do it, anybody can do it, believe me. So now what this image is, is it kind of recaps and it says, okay, the the crosshairs is where we actually mark the LG uh, and then the circle here is the actual target lesion and now it goes in a 25 to negative 25 kind of roll, gives you an image to say, okay, is this LG right at this target lesion? So, so it gives you some kind of idea. Now what's going to happen is the magic happens. And now you have corrected the target. You've done local registration. So this didn't correct too much. It corrected a little bit. I'll show you some data that we have that our average correction is about 15 millimeters. But now what you do is if you need to renavigate, now you renavigate just to the target lesion. And then once you get to the green ball, the green ball is the actual target now that it's there. So once you're there, now you can go into the continuous guidance mode and that's what happened. So what I did there was I actually took out the LG. The LG is no longer in there, but then it kicks in to this extended working channel continuous guidance mode. And this, to me, this is one of the coolest aspects. I, I love this, this, um, this tool. So now you got your crosshairs here, and this is your this is your target. You can kind of see a CT image here, an axial image, and then we've got it set up to where we've got our live fluoroscopy image. So now I can put tools, a radial ebus, anything I want to that, and actually navigate toward that target lesion with biopsy tools or rebus to reposition it, and you can do this live. That's actually a needle right there. So I'm actually sampling right now. And you can see it going back and forth as we sample. And this is about as close to real-time image guidance as you could get, in my opinion. Um, I think we did put a rebus on this, but I didn't record it, and we were right in it. But you certainly can do that. The cool thing about this feature that I can't emphasize enough, and I'll make hopefully a little bit of an argument here at the end, is that um, you can continually manipulate the catheter, the EWC, to make sure you keep optimal alignment as you sample. Think about what you're doing now with the standard EMB system. You can do that, but you don't know if it's accurate or not. And I'm convinced the smaller the nodule, the more likely you are to get deflection as you put tools in and be able to miss that nodule. 
and you really can't see those subtle changes on fluoroscopy, in my opinion. But now you can continually adjust your EWC as you biopsy to make sure that you've got optimal alignment. And I think that this is just a just an awesome um, technique. Now we go ahead and we put fiducials in too, just so you can see what it looks like. This is just, again, reminding you of what the standard Super-D system looks like. And as you know, Super-D, awesome um, technology. We That's pretty much all we've ever used here since 2010. And we've gone through various versions. Um, the latest version before Illumisite, to my knowledge, was the 7.2 version. And the 7.2 version has the fluoroscopic um, correction navigational technology on it. It does not have the continuous guidance. Now Illumisite has both. But just to remind you, this is a standard Super-D system, is that once you take out, I'm biopsying right now, and you can see when I was biopsying, there's no navigational image. I mean, you guys know this. You only have this image. Now, after you've corrected, you can have a continuous guidance. So Illumisite corrects let you do local registration with a fluoroscopic navigation and allows you to do continuous guidance and manipulation to maintain alignment. This is just a case where we had a history of colon cancer at bilateral nodules, and we went in and went after both of these and got adenocarcinoma. There was no complications, but just to give you an idea of what can happen here in the different images. So this is a continual guidance image. That's actually the rebus image there. Um, we went in and biopsied these. Um, you could see the images. They were pretty small lesions. This is about as small as I get here. You can see this one's way up, way up top. Again, these, this is the fluoroscopic bronchosity image. Look at that. It's pretty remarkable. Uh, again, was able to get to that, sample it, no complications. Exceedingly fortunate on this one um, and happy we were able to get a, a, a diagnosis for this patient. Uh, this is another one that had multiple lung lesions. Whoops, yeah. Uh, multiple lung lesions, as you can see. Had this one lesion kind of right there, right on the border of the heart. This is the fluoroscopic um, tomosynthesis image. Again, you get some wonderful images here. Uh, this one was kind of cool. Uh, we did, a, and I'm sorry, these are not the greatest, greatest videos. But what we decided to do with this one is, is I felt like this was most likely going to be metastatic disease, and it certainly was. And this was not, this is actually off an airway, and, and you can't see it as good, unfortunately, on this image. But what we were able to do was, was to take an arc point needle um, and actually poke a hole through the, through the airway and use it like a mini uh, um, cross-country device and then trans, uh, do a Selendinger technique with our EWC using the continuous guidance across that hole that we made and into this lesion. It was really cool. Um, and that's actually what we're doing right now. And I'm going to push pretty hard in just a minute and then push that um, catheter forward. And we were able to get in and get a sample and um, get, a, get a diagnosis for this patient. Fortunately, we, were not, we didn't have any complications. That case was actually done under moderate sedation, by the way. We didn't do that one in the OR. This is another cool feature. Um, it's going to show a little bit of my weakness as a bronchoscopist. But one of the things I get very frustrated with with, with EBUS is that uh, I'm not very good at getting in some of these really um, difficult uh, angled positions for high, high low lymph nodes, and particularly when they're starting to go up into the right upper lobe. So I kind of discovered this by accident. Um, using the continuous guidance feature, I don't, didn't necessarily need to use the fluoroscopic correction on this, but using the continuous guidance feature, I actually used the central navigation mode here and was able to get these lymph nodes um, and could see it almost kind of real-time biopsying. So what we did is this is a continuous guidance. We're just going right up into the right upper lobe, and that's kind of cool. Um, I was really happy about this one because some of these lesions have always been difficult to get to for me. I couldn't get uh, EBUS up there, regular linear or curved linear um, EBUS, and then, of course, it's, it's, it's not something we can get with, with general navigation. So using the central navigation um, mode with a lumicite and the continuous guidance was really kind of neat. Um, so I think if you're out there and you're not able to have EBUS, I know there's some programs that can't have both EBUS and ENB. 
Now with a lumocyte, I think you can do a lot of lymph nodes, standard lymph nodes, with a traditional uh, transbronchial needle aspiration approach, um, but use the continuous guidance mode and the and the central navigation um, platform on the alumocyte and have some great success with lymph nodes. This is one we actually were able to show that acute inflammation. This one was way up there. I was a little reluctant to do this case, and the surgeons caught me into it. Um, this lady had very, very severe COPD, and you can kind of see this thing tracking. And we actually went in and got in it pretty good and just got tons and tons of inflammation and fibrosis out. Nothing cultured out. And right now we've been continuing to follow it. This is about three or four months in, and nothing's changed right now. But you can see these images. We felt pretty confident based on this and based on our rebus images that we were getting at least somewhere along the vicinity of, the, of this lesion because we were getting tissue out that was showing fibrosis and inflammation. And because of these images, just like if you would use um, EBUS for lymph nodes, we felt pretty confident we were in it. So it really did increase our confidence level using this tool. But obviously, this person does have a high pretest probability of malignancy, and we've continued to monitor her for now. She does have fiducials in there in case they decide to go ahead and do SPRT. Another case just kind of shows this is a transplant patient. Uh, everybody was really concerned about cancer with this. Of course, I understand. Uh, so we went in and went after this. And again, using the same kind of mode, you can kind of see we're up here. I apologize. You don't see the fluoroscopy as good as you can actually on my computer. But again, uh, we're able to get to this lesion, very medial, um, no problem. And it turned out to actually be necardia and not cancer. And I actually saw the lady in clinic not too long ago, and that lesion is almost completely gone after appropriate therapy. And this one is really kind of a cool case. Um, another patient uh, right on the chest wall, as you can see, and I really, I think this is the one I kind of want to show you this image. Check this out. Uh, I was really um, <laughs> impressed with this. I, I never thought I would ever be able to do something like this, but check out this image up here. This is actually the chest wall that you're seeing. Um, and we were able to sneak a needle. You could actually watch it, sneak a needle right in on this side because that's the only angle I could get. And um, we're able to get a diagnosis on this. At least that's where I think that I was at, based on the rebus and based on these imaging. Um, and we wound up not having any complications on this patient at all. And then also, uh, I've done a couple of cases with the traditional transbronchial access tool, or, or what we like to call the cross-country with, um, with the uh, alumocyte system. Uh, I've mostly used it like I showed you with that previous case with the arc point and using a guide wire and kind of making a smaller hole across the airways that way and then selling Dinger, the, uh, the EWC over. But this is just to remind you, this is an old school case. It's not a lumocyte, but just kind of remind you of what, what the cross-country device is. Uh, this is just a patient who had metastatic colon cancer and he had this area up here. This is videos courtesy of, of Carlos Anciano, um, one of my uh, thoracic surgeons who's outstanding. Um, and also, I think, has a passion for making videos, but they can tend to be long. But this is kind of cool. Um, we actually did this in the hybrid OR and used comb beam. This is part of the study that we did with, with the cross-country device. But you can see here, we're doing standard um, EMB, and you can kind of see the image here. We're kind of going around it and all this other kind of stuff. So then we decided to do cross-country, and that's exactly what's getting ready to happen right here. We're going to make a little bit of a, of a, of a hole. And then we're going to, here's a cross-country device. You might be able to see a small little needle starting to come out. We're actually poking a hole through the airway. Then we're putting a dilator out. We're dilating up that airway. And then we're going to take this EWC and we're selling Dinger over all that. And this is under, obviously, fluoroscopy. So once that happens, now we put the LG back in and boom, we're right in the middle of it. Now you can see this, what I just showed you without having to take the, um, without losing the navigational image now with the alumocyte. So once we did that, um, then we go in and we start biopsying, which I know you guys have seen a hundred times. This is the comb beam image here. Um, we did do a spin because we wanted to show that the, that the lesion was actually, that the catheter was actually in the lesion. And we're very, very much amateurs at comb beam. This was a couple of years ago. We, we actually never use comb beam anymore. 
for a bronchoscopy, um, but we were doing it for study purposes here. Uh, and you can see now that the EWC is in, and that's a pretty good size lesion, but we were able to see that it was actually in it. Dr. Pritchett, Dr. Bodra are, are true experts at, at utilizing cone beam and other techniques like that for these lesions. This would be a um, a, uh, a chip shot for them. But now we go in and we biopsy, and I know you guys have seen that a hundred times, and then we put fiducials in, and then that's it. So here's some data um, kind of showing you what we've done so far. Um, of the alumocyte, we've done, I think this was 78 nodules, 72 patients, and you can see the amount of malignant uh, versus non-diagnostic versus malignant. And then our diagnostic yield, so we compared this to our standard Super D 7.1 system. Now that's without um, fluoroscopic guidance, that's without continuous navigation. And I think I grabbed this data over a six month time period, there were 137 patients. Um, and the average nodule size was two centimeters. Um, and you can see it's 88%. And this is the alumocyte based on the 78 nodules. And this was over a just a little less than a three-month time period, um, and you can see we went up to 92%. I have gone back and, and did some statistics on this, and this is not statistically significant when you actually um, do, the, um, do the calculations on it, and, and I've got a little bit of a theory of why. Um, this is, again, just showing you the various systems. We also published some data back in, I think it was 2013, 2014, our diagnostic yield then was 72 percent. Um, we've made changes obviously since then. Number one, we got more experience. Number two, uh, was not using rapid onsite evaluation here, but between here to here, the V71, we made all those changes. We got more experience. We also upgraded the ENB system, meaning that the edge catheter came out. A lot of different changes, and you can see our, our diagnostic yield went up to 88 percent, and then this is where the Illuma site went to 92 percent. Uh, and it's just a breakdown between the V7 and, and the alumocyte, just to give you an idea of the breakdown as the percentages. Um, most of the cases that we do here uh, are all moderate sedation. Um, I did 15 or 16 cases here of the alumocyte with, with uh, your anesthesia. I will tell you, um, my advice and the recommendation is to do the is to utilize the alumocyte under. Uh, general anesthesia with a breath hold. I think that's going to give you your most consistent um, use of this of this tool. We're making it work. Um, the images aren't as good as when you do the breath hold, and if it's in the lower load, it's just really difficult because there's so much movement. Um, so I would highly recommend if you have the ability to use general anesthesia or breath hold, that's the best way to do it. Make sure you have the right depth. Make sure you have the right the appropriate fluoroscopy um, um, tools, um, which the, the Medtronic people can help you with. But this is just, again, just showing you a breakdown. We actually, I just submitted this paper uh, yesterday, and uh, it already got rejected in <laughs> 24 hours. It's not my record. My record is rejection within an hour. So we're, we're going to move on and see if we can get this, get this published. Um, hopefully we will. Uh, and that is all I have to say. Dr. Bowling, can you hear me okay? I can. Okay, so a question for you is, you know, you mentioned that you're a two to three centimeter guy. Now that you have this technology, you've been able to see what previously was fluoroscopically invisible become visible. Um, do you see that this technology is going to open the door for you to go after lesions? I mean, I'm looking at some of these cases on the alumocyte, especially the one close to the heart border, um, close to the mediastinum, one on the chest, you know, literally almost on the pleura. These are all, these are really impressive lesions, uh, no matter who you are, uh, going after these lesions. And do you feel that that this platform is really making the big difference? That you jumped from, I think it was uh, 7.1 all the way to Illumisite, and so you really felt the upgrade, and, and just want to kind of hear your thoughts, what your impressions are, and the, the amount of confidence that I'm hearing 
and where where is that in 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 your experience? This is really important because I think five to ten years ago, um, I think Dr. Pritchett, myself, your and and you obviously, Dr. Bowen, we would all agree that boy, we have come a long way, uh, and navigation bronchoscopy is rapidly improving. Yeah, thanks for the question. I, I think there's a few things that that I would comment on. Now, obviously, these are just my opinions, so take them with a grain of salt. But um, number one is I think that if you look at the the study that was out from from our Vanderbilt colleagues, um, they were able to take the standard um, navigational bronchoscopy system and then compare it. Prospective is a wonderful study, and then compare it to the uh, 7.2 system. Um, which was the um, 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 the fluoroscopic navigational um, study uh, uh, tool, and they saw an increase of their yield from 50, I think it's 52 percent, up to 79 percent. So, why didn't we see that big of a jump in our study? No, number one, it wasn't prospective, but I, I think what's going to happen with Illumisite is that. I think people who are having average diagnostic yields based on the literature of around 70 to 72, 73, 74, 75 percent or lower are, is going to see a big jump in their diagnostic yields. That's number one. That's my feeling. I think when you start getting on that higher end, and I'm not trying to say we're super higher end, but that's what I think is happening, is that you – now, what's going to give you a little bit more? I think that – with a continuous navigation, to answer your question, you're going to be able to go after smaller lesions with more confidence because not only is it corrected, not only do you know the actual um, target is the target, but you're able to manipulate that catheter in real time. If you've got a smaller lesion, in my opinion, you have less chance for an error for deflection. So if you deflect a little bit because of, because of your tools or because you you shift a little bit or something changes, and you don't detect that because you don't have a continuous image, uh, you're more likely going to miss the lesion. But now you can continuously keep it aligned. And I think that's, I think this combination is going to make it uh, a really big difference. The, the, the big thing that I'm hoping for and I really, really believe is I think that the technology now with the Illumina site, it's extremely easy to use. I know it sounds I don't want to sound arrogant about it. I don't mean that. I really think it's super easy to use, and I think that a lot of people, once they get their hands on it, um, maybe that didn't use a lot of navigation before the Super D is going to really take off because that confidence is going to be there, and um, it's it's just so much user friendly in my opinion. But that's what I'm excited about, and I think the people before my opinion and the two centimeters, um, I think because of their confidence, you're going to see more and more people use the navigation more often because you're going to have more confidence in what the target is, and then as you buy out, you're going to keep that continuous alignment. That's just my humble opinion about it. I could be wrong, but I think that's why we didn't see a statistically different um, massive change in, in our diagnostic yield. Now, that being said, it was a pretty crappy study we did. I mean, it was retrospective. Dr. Bowling, your your phone is uh is can you hear me now? Yeah, perfect, perfect. Okay. Uh, you were saying? Yeah. Sorry, I'll just hold it up like this. But um, so in our study, the the, the one that, that that we're submitting now, again, just just for all transparency's sake, is that it is a retrospective study, um, and that the the data that we got from the from the seven one is six months consecutive um, patients. Uh, but but it's it's kind of broken up in there, and mostly because unfortunately we we had a big issue with our database. But it is persistent data, and I went back and checked all of it. Um, so I do think that it's it, it 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 is accurate. But I would really 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 want to see a prospective study of looking at at something like a Lumisite with the standard um, you know like 7.2 system to see if it does make that much of a difference. I believe it will. Um, just for, just from the, the the little experience that I have, but but that's my take on it, and that's where I see it. And I also think that it's going to open up for folks like yourself, and for for Dr. Pritchett, and a lot of 
really, really talented bronchoscopists out there. I think this system is going to open up a lot of things for therapy. Um, maybe if you don't have cone beam or if you don't have some of the other things, if you use this, you still might be able to, to utilize this technology um, maybe someday to be able to open up for therapy like ablation if we get very confident in utilizing the system and using Rebus and knowing that where you put the catheter is the catheter. Um, so I, I think it's only going to get better from here. Um, I don't know if uh, Dr. Pritchett, can you, uh, are you still there? There you are. Okay, so there's a question from the audience, and this is kind of um, geared towards, you know, the experience that somebody has with digital tomosynthesis versus cone beam. Um, the question is, is there a longer learning curve to get used to coordinating the tomosynthesis maneuver compared to, say, cone beam CT? This is coming from Dr. Mittal. Yeah, I think that's a good question. Um, I think, honestly, you could learn both pretty easily. I think that, you know, there are a few more um, technical things, but it's more software uh, that you'll have to learn with cone beam. Uh, I do think that uh, the, you know, the software that's built into Fluoromav and Lumicide, as, as Dr. Bowling said, like, you know, if you can read, you can do it, which is true. So it might be easier because it literally takes you through on screen every step of the way. So it's kind of hard to mess up. But with that being said, I mean, we've, we've taught people how to use cone beam. Uh, and, and after five or 10 cases, they just have it down if they have the same team and consistent staff uh, in there, which is exactly what you'd want for Fluoronav to um, you know, the, the same team in there who really knows what they're doing. So I'd say that the learning curve is, is about the same in my experience. Certainly, um, you can speak to that too, as you've done Fluoronav and, and lots of cone beam as well. Yeah, I, I tend to agree. I think Fluoronav in particular, because everybody's familiar with what a C arm looks like. It's in our room. We know what it looks like. We know how to use it. Um, obviously, it's an application of the C arm, but to speak to Dr. Bowling's point, I think one of the things that's really astonishing about these types of technologies with digital tomosynthesis is we're seeing really amazing imaging occurring uh, in the field of peripheral uh, bronchoscopy or guided bronchoscopy. And my impression is is that we're we're moving closer towards um, you know two different uh, thought processes that are are really gaining traction in our field. One is ventilation protocols. Um, you know, we can do all these things to control our catheter, but if we control the lung, then we maybe can keep the, the nodule still enough for us to be able to biopsy. And then the second piece is real-time intraoperative imaging. Obviously, it's not true intraoperative imaging. Um, and I think these are the two uh, – can you speak to that? Like, do you see that these are the two movements that are occurring? Um, and – you know, contrast that to other platforms and what your thoughts are. And I think one of the things is really kudos to Medtronic for at least recognizing that intraprocedural imaging is going to be a key component to navigational bronchoscopy. Yeah, I'm not sure which one of us the question was directed to, but, uh, but I agree with you that, um, again, it's one thing to recognize CT to body divergence. Everybody's really done that. The question is, is do you have something built into your technology to overcome that or to fix that or adjust for that? And so that intra-procedural real-time imaging and using that beyond just standard fluoroscopy um, is really important. Uh, again, a lot of companies are, are, are working on this. There's some exciting other platforms uh, that are coming out there, but, but Medtronic has made it commercially available and, and leveraged it on top of um, a really ubiquitous platform that, that most people uh, are familiar with already. So I think that combined with anesthesia, as you know, the ventilation protocols, I feel just by itself will increase your diagnostic yield if you do those no matter what platform you're using. So I think the combination of those two things um, is part of the evolution that you're mentioning. I don't have a lot of experience with, with cone being um, just the brief amount that we had with our with our study and um, with a cross country device. What I do think though is is you know I, I wonder about the average user out there and um, like I say the guy across the street. I, I'm in a very large medical center. We have a lot of big fancy tools, but what about the guy down the street? 
of the guy that has another prac that might not. And, and I real this that's where I think not that it's not going to help people in the big big centers, but the folks who have the standard kind of bronchoscopic equipment and have C arms. And th- that is where I think alumicide is going to make the biggest impact. And that's just my opinion. It is not hard, guys. I'm telling you, it really, really, really is not hard. Um, and you don't have to have super-duper-duper-duper special training, in my opinion. If you can wield a bronchoscope and you're a, you're a bronchoscopist and you do some bronchoscopies, if you take a little time, um, you can do this. And I think, in my opinion, the Illumicide has made it much easier. There's a little bit of learning curve you got to learn. Mostly what frustrates me a little bit is just there's a little extra wires and it's muscle memory stuff. Outside of that, you don't have to have a broxcope holder, none of that other kind of stuff, in, in my opinion, or at least I don't, to be able to do the sweep. If you have capability for cone beam and all the other things, I think it's great. But I think a lot of people most likely do not. Um, and I think if you have the opportunity um, – to, to utilize a tool like this, if you're already doing navigation, I would highly recommend it. Now, I will say, no doubt about it, I am a, I am a, a Super D fan. I am. That's just the bottom line. I've always used it. I've never used anything else. And the reason I haven't is because we've had success and there's been no reason to use anything else. Um, so you have to take that from being biased of, of, of just my experience. But that is my experience, and, and I really, really think that um, – I can't wait till this gets in the hands of some really talented folks like you guys and a lot of other talented bronchoscopists out there because it's just going to make the alumicite better. If I can use it, I'm telling you, anybody can use it. On that note, uh, thank you, Dr. Bowling, Dr. Pritchett. I'm going to hand it back to uh, Jody. Um, and thank you guys for this very insightful discussion about accuracy and peripheral navigation, CT to body divergence, ventilation protocols, and of course to Dr. Bowling for those great videos, uh, you know, introducing us to uh, Illumicite. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Dr. Appreciate yes, thank you so much. Appreciate you thank moderating you. Dr. Badra and Dr. Pritchett and Dr. Bowling. Thanks so much for sharing your tips and advice, um, your insights. You certainly have great experience, um, and I, I, this was a really robust discussion, so thank you so much. I know we made a note the recording will be posted to the ATS uh, YouTube channel in about a week, so if you want to go back and revisit uh, the talk, you have the opportunity to do so. And again, thank you so much. We appreciate you joining us tonight. Have a wonderful evening. Take care, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.